Too many introductory remarks because I know we have a very full program this morning. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, you should have all gotten the schedule of the whole year. If you've got a scheduling problem, I don't really want to hear about it. <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, you can either let me know or let Joan know. The usual, uh, I think everybody who wanted this, which I should have heard from by now, but if something comes up, the usual rule is you, you try and work out a trade for yourself. But if you can't, uh, let us know and we'll work it out for you. Um, the other thing is we switched to the university providing the webinar broadcast. And we switched to the university providing CME and CNE. And even though I've been working with the CME office for two months, they haven't gotten their act together in at least this week's session, although I do want you to fill out all the forms, you're not going to get CME for this one week, but all the other sessions going forward should be fine. For those people on the outside, uh, with this new system, we don't actually have any way of knowing who's signed on. Your name doesn't show up on the screen here. So for people on the outside, when you want to get CME credit, you have to sign in with the magic secret word. And the magic secret word will be changed every week, and it'll be told to you, and I'll tell you for this week, it's Husky. <laughs> so we can have some fun picking out magic secret words. Sometimes for me, one week, it'll definitely be Lakers. <laughs> All right. Um, the, the last thing I want to do is just introduce or have people introduced who are new to our allergy community. Uh, Paul, you've got a new colleague you want to introduce. This is Brett Buckmiller. He's joined us from Texas, and he's in our new Smoky Point office. So he'll be probably not coming to the meeting except online, yeah. but I want him to meet everybody. Good. And we've got two new fellows in the program. And I'll ask you guys to just stand up and introduce yourselves. Uh, Matt Altman, um, from Boston. I'm David Hagen, from Israel. Anybody else uh, that uh, is new in the room or any other introductions? Otherwise, let's go ahead and get the first session started. Uh, you can see the title up here on the screen, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Uh, Basically, this is a very important presentation, something we usually don't spend any time on. It's the backbone of our business. Is what makes us as allergists unique from any other subspecialty. It has to do with allergenic extracts, preparing them, standardizing them, uh, using them for diagnostic testing, using them in immunotherapy. And I think most of us in this field just take it for granted that this is the reagents we work with every day, but we don't know very much about them. So Larry Garner was nice enough to fly all the way up from Texas to give this presentation, probably happy to get out of the heat. He's a, an independent allergy consultant, uh, worked in that capacity for 26 years with Hollis and Steer, uh, and was on the Practice Parameters Committee, a member of the American Academy, the American College, and I'm happy to welcome you here this morning. Thank you. appreciate being here, and uh, interestingly enough, when I left Texas, it actually got cool, and it started to rain. Um, the reason uh, I say the good, the bad, the ugly is I'm going to give you an awful lot of information. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, and some of it's ugly. With that being said... The goals of this lecture are to give you a glimpse of manufacturing processes to make allergen extracts, an understanding of cross-reactivity, and its importance, and finally, the difficulty of standardizing allergen extracts. Everyone here has probably heard what the FDA did back in October of last year. Uh, there were over 590-some-odd allergens that they are officially looking at taking off the market in some way or form. So what I'm going to do is take you through the process of making an allergy extract, the journey from the beginning to the final product. But first, you have to start with raw material. It's collected from fields, trees, other sources, cat, dog, cockroaches. It has to meet specific FDA QA guidelines. 
less than 1% foreign material, has to be identified by a botanist. What are you doing? Once that occurs and it's collected, it's cleaned, dried, and it's sent to a manufacturing to what begin a filtration there? process for sterility. Understand that the way you sterilize allergen extract is you filter them. You continuously filter them through smaller and smaller and smaller filters until the final filter is 0 0.02 microns. This just happens to be box elder. And um, one reason why the PowerPoint couldn't be sent out over the, our great airwaves of, inter, of the internet is because when you have a lot of JPEG pictures, it's like gigabytes of information base, and it crashes servers. This is paper birch. Now, when someone goes out to collect, the, we have collectors. Most of the manufacturers have what they call their own licensed collector groups. These collector groups go out and collect this raw material, send it to the manufacturer. In order for that to occur, they have to have the material identified by botanists. They have to identify the pollen. They have to send a sample of the actual plant with the actual raw material. The reason for that was, is years ago, there were actually mistakes. People would get a collection and the collector would tell them it was Timothy, and it may well be Bermuda grass, but they didn't identify it. There was no way to go back and look at it other than put it under a microscope. This is common cottonwood. Now once it's hand, it's, some things are hand-picked. As you can see, what they're doing right here is they're actually shaking off the pollen from the anthers. And you notice they're wearing masks. That's to keep from contaminating the actual material. These are drying racks where they're actually drying out the pollen. And this happens to be bluegrass. Now, the FDA, in their great wisdom, uh, at one time said, you have this tractor with these vacuum cleaners on it, and you're vacuuming up pollen. So how do you sterilize your tractor? And we went back and said, well, that's a great idea, except we have to build a swimming pool big enough so we can drive it into an alcohol vat, or what do we do with it? Well, the FDA said you have to get rid, you can't say that you collected, let's say from a ragweed field, and then you went to a bluegrass field, how do you know that ragweed still wasn't in your vacuum cleaner or in the filter? So what happens now, and the reason why it takes some time, sometimes you hear back order or that you know it's that there's a allergen that's not available right away. Think about this. It takes six weeks to take that thing apart, clean it, and put it back together again. Okay? That's minimum. That's hoping that everything goes back and the guy that took it apart remembered where all the parts are. So six weeks. If you don't have two of these, or three of these, and these are not inexpensive pieces of equipment. They're extremely, uh, that's about, probably about three quarters of a million dollars sitting on, pop, on top of that thing. Um, it's not that, it's not, it's a, it's an endeavor that takes a lot of awful lot of time to do it. So specifically the larger ones aren't used that much because of the process of having to clean them. Now you notice this one, you see the two, this actually goes to a, a hand vac, which is back behind this guy. And um, he's actually vacuuming pollen off of the plant. Raw material to finish product. You start with a dried material mixed with a fluid. Licenses on, in the United States are you can extract in glycerin, cocos, normal saline with phenol, and albumin serum. I said in order to make an extract, it's filtered. Liquid is filtered through numerous filters, decreasing in size until your final filter is 0 0.02 microns. Again, think of the time involved in this. Think of a coffee filter and think of, a, of honey. Pour honey in a coffee filter. 
I can tell you right now that you can come back in about two weeks and maybe that honey will be in the coffee pot below it. Okay? That's what happens when you try and when you're filtering down through 0 0.02 microns and you have a glycerinated extract. <clears throat> After filtering is completed, liquids transferred by an aseptic technique to sterile vials. Vials are stoppered and capped, labels are applied, they're inspected for particulates, it's boxed, the product refrigerated until shipped to customers. Start to finish time. This is an important number to remember. From the time the raw material is collected until the time it goes out the door is three to four months. Manufacturing time. Now, there's additional time on there if it happens to be a standardized extract. Because for the, before you can ship a standardized extract, the FDA has to say it meets their standardization limits. So depending on how fast they want to turn around the sample that you send to them, could add four weeks to this process, could add another three months to the process. So in the real world, you're looking at from start to finish, best scenario, probably six months to get an extract out the door. That's why manufacturers hold inventory, and that's why expiration dates generally run around about two and a half to three years on most allergen extracts. The actual extra expiration date window for a glycerinated extract is six years. But by the time you take in the process, the process of mixing, the process of getting it out the door, a lot of that time is already chewed up. <clears throat> um, manufacturing, there's differences from manufacturers. Um, some manufacturers have to extract in phenylated solutions, then they add glycerin. Phenol denatures protein. Uh, there's one manufacturer currently who has an AP process, which gives very potent concentrated extracts. That's, for instance, AP dog. It's 140 micrograms per ml versus a weight to volume 1 to 10 dog, which is 1 to 5 micrograms. Extraction in 50% glycerin is difficult to achieve in timely fashion. Think of the honey going through the coffee filter. There are currently two manufacturers I'm aware of in the United States that have licenses to extract in 50% glycerin. Said phenol affects protein. The two, one and three, are actually the same as number two, except three and one are different amounts of phenol in the extraction fluid. Guess what happened to the proteins? There are not there. Two manufacturers on number two, they are. 50% glycerin is bacteria static. It takes an enormous amount of time to filter. It's a couple of manufacturers that devise a sterile environment to force glycerin rated liquids through filters. This process eliminates using a phenylated solution for initial extractions and filterization and then adding glycerin. Actually, it's done in a closed vacuum system. You suck the stuff through the filter, so you speed up the process. Now we're going to jump to cross reactivity. Can I ask you just one question? That you yes. sort of implied in the beginning, looking at the collection, that you guys intentionally grow fields of, say, ragweed? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're As a matter of fact, you can't grow ragweed in Washington. Yeah. Well, in Western Washington. Or Washington, Washington, because it doesn't exist. Why so is that? It would, it, I've always wondered why it won't grow. I don't know. I don't, I, maybe it's what's in the ground. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it was interesting because the only way we could do it, we had to do it in greenhouses. And we had to we had to prove that none of the uh, none of the material was going to get out into the atmosphere to um, possibly pollinate and start ragweed in the state of Washington. So, but normally most manufacturers will have collectors, and a lot of them are farmers that will actually plant a field, for instance, a Timothy grass or a field for Bermuda grass. Um, most of the manufacturers rely on a collector system. And collectors for that reason, because then they can they can also monitor the amount of herbicides and things that are applied to the fields and so forth. If they just simply went out and collected somewhere. There's no way of knowing what other contaminant material might be on that. 
And it's a considerable process to clean pollen. You know, if it is contaminated or if it's got particulate matter in it, it takes forever sometimes to clean them. One of the things I didn't tell you is that part of that process is, is when you get a collection from someone and it has more than 1% uh, contaminated or contaminant material in it, that could be twigs, dirt, whatever, we have to clean it. And that takes a considerable amount of time for a very small return on investment because we're not talking gallons of this stuff. We're talking grams of weight. Um, you know, a, petri or a pint bottle or a quart bot jar of pollen is enough to make, say, probably three lots of glycerinated product in a weight-to-volume solution. So it's not a lot of material. Um, <clears throat> the, the big thing for the manufacturers is the manufacturers, I think, are, are hoping that um, slick gets approved by the FDA. For the reason is, is because now you'll be making this stuff in tanker trucks instead of in liter bottles for the amount of volume that you're going to have to use. So it becomes a volume issue. How big a field do you need to produce some of these things? Depends on the pollen. It actually depends on the pollen. Uh, there are some very, very proliferous pollinating plants. Ragweed's one. Uh, if you go out and find giant ragweed or short ragweed someplace, one plant can drop a lot of pollen very quickly. Then there's other things such as uh, Tree of Heaven, which happens to be a very sticky pollen, in it, and it's very difficult to collect. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to get that pollen off of the anthers. So each their different plants have different amounts of uh, pollen that they produce. Generally speaking, Probably about an acre for grass will give you about, I think the last time I looked at that was about 10 or 20 to 40 grams of good pollen material. It's, it's, it's not something that, you know, it's easily collected. It takes a lot of space. Um, one of the things that you're going to be faced with in the future is most of the pollen collectors today are older and they're not passing it on to the next generation. Um, and the reason for it, it's very costly for them to do it, and there's not much profit involved in it anymore because of regulations and things they have to go through. It used to be you could go out and collect it, send it to the manufacturer, the manufacturer made it. But now you've got to have a licensed botanist look at it. You've got to have all kinds of things from the collection part process all the way through to the time it's shipped to the manufacturer. There are things that the FDA can regulate. So it's become a it's it's almost become non uh, non profitable to actually collect pollen. How much do you have to collect to supply every allergist in the United States with say a common thing like Timothy grass? You're probably looking at we average about two thousand grams of certain allergens, but understand there's three manufacturers. One manufacturer could not manufacture today the pollen or the extracts that are necessary one company cannot do it and the reason for that is the process you know in order for in order for you to make a to make an extract today under FDA guidelines at one time they wanted individual rooms per allergen okay yeah think about this back in 1993 in a room this size, I could have 80 filtration systems going. The only way it could be cross-contaminated is if I actually took the tube from this system, went across the room and plugged it into another tube. Okay, well, the FDA said that's not, that's not a good idea. We want individual rooms, individual HEPA-filtered rooms, etc. So <clears throat> what we did instead of making individual rooms was we actually designed individual containers to hold the systems that were that met the same requirements as it being an individual room. But you went from a large room or, an, or a, a bio clean room to where you could do 20, 30, 40 extractions. Now you're down to eight in one room. So physically, to do the amount of material for one company, they need probably about 50 acres of rooms. Okay. I mean, that's the problem with this. 
cross-reactivity. <clears throat> High dose immunotherapy to practice parameters. Um, in order to get these levels, okay, you can't have more than 10 allergens in a vial. So if you're limited to 10 allergens in a vial, you've got to figure out what 10 are going in there. You need BAUs. There's literature now that shows that a high dose, high dose immunotherapy works. It's very effective. The problem is when you put allergens together, you dilute them. The only way that you're going to get to a smaller amount of allergens in a vial is you've got to understand cross-reactivity. The 2003 practice parameters were the first practice parameters for your <clears throat> specialty in immunotherapy that actually addressed cross-reactivity. Fewer antigens is better therapy. To achieve proper BAUs, you need less antigens in a mix. Cross-reactivity is necessary to achieve less antigens in the mix. Less antigens equals higher BAUs. I will tell you right now, you cannot use skin testing for a cross-reactivity model. And the reason for that is, you have no idea what strength those allergens are. What's cross-reactive? Oaks, junipers, ragweed, artemisia, grasses, some molds, cedars. <clears throat> This is a Venn diagram out of Nelson's book on allergy and immunotherapy. My recommendation is you should only have three grasses. Timothy, Bermuda, and Johnson. How many grasses pollinate the continental United States? Depends on whose botany book you read. Anywhere between six to 8,000. Okay, what do we know about grass? First of all, we know most systemic reactions come from grass, or used to. Secondly, at best, in any catalog across the country, you might have had 12 grasses, maybe 16. 16 grasses, 6,000, 8,000. Patients get grass immunotherapy, they get better. Logically, that tells me they cross-react. There's a paper that was published a couple of years ago on Timothy grass. It showed if you use Timothy grass alone, you covered, by their database, 95% of the patient population that was allergic to grass. I have made this bet, and so far no one has collected, if I asked someone in this room, under a microscope, to identify ragweed simply by its pollen, you cannot tell me if it's short, giant, western, false, southern, because they all look alike. Now, you can if you get different magnifications and if you do some things with different stains and a bunch of other things, you may be able to. Can we go back to grass for a second? We don't have any Johnson or Bermuda grass here. So basically all we have is common northern grasses. Timothy would be enough to cover every patient in the Pacific Northwest. Problem is most people travel, so they're exposed to the other grasses. The other side of that is, is just simply because you don't have Bermuda doesn't mean that you don't have one of the strains or one of the different varieties of a typical grass. Remember, I'm talking about 8,000, 6,000, 8,000 grasses, okay, in a country. And yeah, so <clears throat> you may use them as a, you may, in, in reference, take a look and see, um, I don't know how many golf courses you have in the Northwest. I'm assuming that you probably got either bent grass greens or some type of grass, some type of grandma grass greens because they don't freeze out. Bermuda will freeze out. 
so they have to replace Bermuda grass greens every year. So you probably have bent grass or something like that. And if you look at the if you look at the families of grasses, the three grasses identified cover the three families. And if you look at all those families of grasses, there's thousands of grasses under each one of those families. That's why I picked those three. Is there any company that's working on just a combination of those three that you said for their grass mix? There's some. They're looking at some. Some companies are looking at that because eventually, I think I think the amount of allergens that you all as allergists are going to be able to utilize are going to be very confined and very constricted for a number of reasons. Standardization is one. Uh, trying to collect it's the other. Um, and it depends on what the FDA wants to do. Oops. Okay. What's cross-reactive? Burgess, hickory, alders, alders, birch, hazel, olive ash, privet, amaranthus, maples, elms. Cross-reactive. Mesquite's been shown to cross-react with American sycamore, sweet gum, live oak, white oak, birches, hickory, conch, black walnut, bayberry, American elm, hackberry, mulberry box elder, maple, ash, and crow. Cross-reactivity of major ragweeds is very strong based on radial allergen absorbent test inhibition. This is published in um, the references are listed. Cross-reactivity of the trees, the birch family, the olive family is cross-reactive, the conifer family is cross-reactive, the beech oak family, uh, pecan and hickory, and the caria family, and the popular family, you got popular cottonwood and aspen. So if you look at the immunotherapy practice parameters, which were published in 2007, again in two, or 2003, 2007, and 2011, they addressed that you should pick a particular allergen <coughs> indigenous to your area, okay, that covers the other ones. And I looked at over 1,000 test lists across the country a number of years ago and couldn't tell you on some of them whether the patient had been skin tested or not. On the other ones, there were actual plants or trees or weeds that weren't even indigenous to the actual area where the test list came from. And in others, <clears throat> there were 80 to 100 allergens on that panel. Okay, You can't put more than 10 allergens in the vial if you're going to get the doses that are required in your parameters. It doesn't work. Math doesn't work. So if you look at the northern prairie grasses, I recommend Timothy. Uh, if you look at the other grass, Bermuda. Uh, you brought up the fact that you don't have Bermuda. Notice several western prairie grasses. You probably have some of the western prairie grasses out here in some of the different elevations. And in uh, the Pancoidia family, Johnson grass. The only reason why I say Johnson grass is because Johnson grass is relatively easy to collect. Okay, it covers Bahia grass. So as a, as a manufacturer, I'm going to get, I'm going to try and keep something that's relatively easy to correct, collect, and is less expensive than Bahia grass. Ragweeds, <coughs> ragweeds, cocklebur, burweed, Artemisia groups. Generally speaking, if you're in the genus family, okay, you take one allergen from that genus family, you're cross, they're cross-reactive with all the other ones in that family. Can this is taken to, right out of your practice. Can you go back to trees? Could you is there a bottom line then for this part of the country with all that cross-reactivity, what trees we should use? Can I go backwards? Yeah, just there. Somewhere. That one? Oh, that one. Okay. There you go. There? Yeah. yeah. You were asking what? Well, what? An allergy here in Seattle or west of the Cascade Mountains. Knowing that, what trees, minimal number of trees do we need to cover 
everything. In your area? Yeah. That's something I'm not I'm not that familiar with your area. However, what I would pick is the the most indigenous trees, one of those trees out of each one of those groups. So you're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six trees. Possible. Yeah, we do that. We have one from the I just wanted to see if we agreed with what we're doing. So how many how many people here for in the birch family would just put like the birch in? Cost yeah, most of us put alder and birch in as the two dominant trees here. Are we wasting space? Should we make use of that cross reactivity? Yep. Definitely. You can use either one. What about hazelnut? Doesn't that have something that's slightly different? Or it's, it's, you could just Remember, I said you cannot use skin testing as, as, a, as a guide for cross reactivity. And the reason is your hazelnut allergen could be a thousand times stronger or a thousand times weaker than your birch scratch material. So you, there's no way to tell. However, you can tell by taking amino blots and SDS pages and looking at those because if the proteins are the same for each one of those trees and the amino blots from the patient's serum attaches to each one of those, then it's, then it's cross-reactive. More and more, the science is getting better, and we're looking at much more things. I firmly believe that you probably could get by with maybe 20 allergies, total, because of the proteins. The proteins all are very similar. They all fall within a certain molecular weight. And so eventually, I think you're going to see that happen. And I understand everything up to where you say you can't use skin testing to correlate, but. If we skin test, you think we should only skin test for the boards that we're going to go into immunotherapy, or should we still keep skin testing and then condense it once you have your results? I'll answer that two ways. As a purist, I would only skin test for the ones that I know are going in the serum, or could possibly go in the serum. However, as a business person, <laughs> okay, I would say you skin test for whatever you're going to get reimbursed for. <laughs> All right? However, you can't put all of those in the mix. Okay. So then when you, you well, for instance, if you test for all seven prairie grass, there are seven northern grasses, okay, your dilemma then becomes which grass do I plant? In that case, you use Timothy out of the seven grasses. So from your skin test to your actual serum mix, okay, that's where you use the cross reactivity model if you want to go that route. Right. You'll notice that reimbursements are changing. Um, I don't know what it is in Washington, but I know in some states they're only reimbursing for 42 to 60 allergens. So third-party carriers are beginning to see this picture. Um, so those things are happening. So at some point in time, you know, that question may be answered for you and not by your specialty. Okay? Which you're, yeah, sounds, sounds what we have already. So moving along, these are all these are statements coming right out of your practice parameters. So if you understand the literature, um, inadequate testing material gives less desirable results in cross reactivity. The reason why we can specifically state for the grasses how cross reactive they are because they're standardized, quote unquote. <clears throat> they're pretty much similar in strength. And when you test patients, you generally see if they're allergic to Timothy, they're also allergic to one of the other northern prairie grasses, or they, they show up hot for one of the other grasses. Um, logic would have us believe that all phylogenic groups probably cross-react. New methodologies are showing better cross-reactivity models. Food for thought. Texas has 17 oak species, ranging from scrub oak to black oak to red oak to Therapy generally consists of red, white, and Virginia lye. The only reason why it's a mix is that's because that's one of the most profitable allergens manufacturers sell. You could very well just use red, white, or Virginia lye. Patients improve, oaks are cross reactive. Texas has numerous species of ragweed. Therapy is giant short western. The reason why it's a mix is because that's one of the most profitable extracts to manufacture and sell. 
You could use giant ragweed, you could use short ragweed, or you could use western. doesn't matter. Patients get better ragweeds are cross-reactive. Numerous molds exist. How many molds do you think are in the environment? I venture to say it's infinite. <laughs> Something else people don't understand, molds mutate. You can start with aspergillus. Culture it four times, you no longer have aspergillus. You have something else. <clears throat> One of the reasons why probably, and I haven't seen what the latest, uh, I'm assuming at the college meeting there's going to be a lot of discussion. Mm -hmm. The FDA <laughs> probably wants only one mole. I don't know what time though. And that's all I don't know when it will be over. Oh. I have no idea. And there's probably good reason for that. Stay for dinner again. It's the only one that's got any data. It's poor, it's bad clinical data, but there is some data on Altenaric. Cladosporium has, I believe, two studies that were done in Europe. It's questionable whether either one of those studies was done by what would meet clinical studies today. But all the other moles, there's no clinical data. When you say clinical data, you mean proof of evidence? I mean double-blind, placebo-controlled, standard clinical database on efficacy and uh, yeah, efficacy. The general wisdom is we don't have alternate area here. And since there's no value of immunotherapy with the others, I personally never put people on mold immunotherapy. I don't know if it's the time for a group discussion, but um, I don't know what your take on it or anybody else in the room. I venture to say that you could probably treat every patient in the continental United States with Altenary. Because if you look at that protein, that protein is in every mold. Just call, they call it something else. But by molecular weight, it's the same yeah. protein. Same protein. So if, you, so if you conduct skin testing and they're because they've lived in other places, so they're sensitized to three or four molds, you would only put Altenaria in the IT vaccine. Yep. I'm going to tell you that skin testing with mold is yeah at best a crapshoot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if I told you what was in that extract, as far as the actual irritant material in that extract versus the actual allergenic protein, yeah, it's a crapshoot. Aspergillus. Aspergillus. There's no good data on aspergillus. No clinical data. Uh, the recommendations that I saw is some of those molds were going to be used for skin testing only, but were not going to be allowed for. Di uh, they could be used for diagnostic purposes, but not for therapeutic purposes. And I don't. My reading of that was that. Um, you have to understand the FDA has been dealing with this since 1969, and they've come out with lists, a, come, a number of lists on uh, recommendations, and nothing's been done. So I think they they're at the point now where I think they're going to make the decision that they will do something. If you go back to the pollens and the cross reactivity, is there data that says if you use just one of the group, you get better immunotherapy success than if you use multiple members of the group? I, I'm referring back to the Timothy paper, where they looked at looked, they looked at just Timothy, and I don't know if they did a comparison with with you know four grasses versus one, but my logic would tell me if I'm diluting it even though there's cross-reactivity within that mix, I'm still diluting the major protein down. And if I add anything else in there, then I would still drop down the amount of major allergen that I'm putting in the patients. So I'd prefer to use just one. So when we get our seven grass mix at 100,000 units, it's still better to just use Timothy, in your opinion? Yeah. With all the difficulties in collection and manufacturing, we think that manufacturers would think of synthetic ways of producing these so that they could be more easily identified and positive. Monoclonal antibodies or monoclonal. The problem with that is if you read the FDA papers of 1993, Jay Slater did a, uh, published a paper. And in that paper, <clears throat> one of the things he addressed was monoclonal antibodies, monoclonal research, and the use of monoclonal 
type synthetic materials. And one of his hypotheses was you have to prove in that system that you do not have a retrograde virus. Okay? There's not technology available today that will do that. So in order for me to prove that, it would cost so much in the actual research dollars and dollars that it wouldn't be worth it, no matter how cheap I could make my allergen extract. It takes way too much time. So I don't think you're going to see modified synthetic allergens, not in the near future. Um, Europe's played around with them. Everybody in here familiar with Crete? Crete? Yeah, Crete. You, you know which I'm, what I'm talking about. They started with five. Or they attempted to start with five. Sometimes they work for skin testing, but they don't work for therapy. So they only have one now. And I think it's Timothy. I think Timothy is the only one that they were able to actually show efficacy in both skin testing and therapy. So it's not a, as good a science as everybody wants to believe yet. Eventually it might happen. Um, Cross-reactivity occurs. The literature, although somewhat lacking, helps prove the point. Cross-reactivity exists and can help trim the number of allergens in your treatment vials. We're all different, yet so much alike. So that's cross-reactivity. We have different colors, sexes, yet we share many of the same cellular structures. Um, I kind of believe that you know whoever the master planner was and put this all together, he started with basic building blocks and just altered a few things to get different things. That's the same we're dealing with pollens, molds, mites, etc. There's an interesting study that was at the academy meeting <clears throat> just last year that looked at some of the uh, mites, cat, dog, and interestingly enough, they found cross-reactive allergens in those mammals and insects to pollens. Goes back to my, maybe we only need 20 allergens or a handful of allergens. Maybe what we need is 10 or 15 of the major proteins. So. Uh, some of the objections we address or I address a lot is all species types do not cross-react. We can only go by the science we have. All proteins banned do not cross-react. How often do you hear the fact that there's short ragweed has seven allergenic proteins? One of them happens to be a big one, and that's MA1. <clears throat> I think they cross-react. Um, my patients allergic to an antigen not cross-reactive are available. There seems to be synergy when high-dose immunotherapy is used. So very few allergens given at a high enough dose tends to cover a lot of things. Using a few vaccines may well cover many. <clears throat> now we're going into one of my favorite topics. Major allergy, fact or fiction. This is where it gets up. <laughs> you do not have a standardized extract. No matter what you've been told. You have one extract that is standardized. What is it? Venom. 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 Why? 100 micrograms is 100 micrograms is 100 micrograms is 100 micrograms, period. No matter who makes it, no matter who puts it in a bottle, that process is standardized all the way through. And it's 100 micrograms is always going to be 100 micrograms. There is no intra-assay validation. There's no extra-assay validation. There's no reagent standardization. There's no laboratory to laboratory standardization, manufacturer to manufacturer standardization, and there's cloudy data on what actually constitutes a major allergy. That made me feel better. <laughs> but it works anyway. 
European allergen extracts. Micrograms of major allergens given in articles on sublingual limited therapy to express dose administered cannot be used to translate the dose to U.S. extracts. Extract potency can only be compared if uniform test methods and reference extracts are used. Note the key words. Uniform test methods and reference extracts. Previous slide. There's no industry standardization. There's no assay standardization. There's no serum standardization. Let's go down the list. Apart from micrograms of major allergen, the quality of allergen extracts depend on antigen composition, allergen extract purification, stability, and overall potency. Remember the phenol slide I showed you? Some manufacturers extract in phenylated saline as the first extraction. What happens to some of those proteins? For complex allergens, the measure of total IgI IgE binding capacity might be important to give additional potency information because it also measures the presence of various minor allergens. Furthermore, the measure in micrograms of major allergen as such is not a standardized procedure worldwide. The outcome depends on the technique, the reference extract, and the antibodies used. Monoclonal antibodies may not bind to all relevant isoallergens and may give different values from rabbit assays. As a consequence, the comparison of allergen extracts of different companies is of limited use unless the same analytic methods and materials are used. In other words, the assays have to be standardized. The reagents have to be standardized. The process has to be standardized. <clears throat> Diagnostic parameters 2008. All allergens can be standardized either by radioimmunodiffusion or immunoassay inhibition based on major allergenic epitopes. The FDA selected BAU instead because in vitro analytic technique would have been variable from allergen to allergen and would have caused great confusion. Anyone who is getting a vial that is labeled with a number in micrograms, okay, if you dose that, changing your dose every lot. That's how much variability there is in major allergy. Some manufacturers will give you a mean value. And the reason why they give you a mean value is because it's all over the board. <clears throat> Again, this is taken right out of the practice parameters. By the way, I am the only non-medical, non-PhD reviewer for the practice parameters. Um, <clears throat> you say that CAT standardized? Who knows the release limits for CAT? In Feldy 1 units. As a manufacturer, I can put 10,000 BAUs on a label. On the label. As long as my FELD-D1 units fall between 9.99 and 19.99. That's a hell of a window. Release limits for short ragweed? 100 to 300 MA1 units. There's over 200 allergens that don't have major allergens assigned. Major allergens vary in strength in the same allergen extract. The major allergen may not be the most allergenic allergen. Allergens are often made up of numerous proteins which may or may not be allergenic. What we know, numerous proteins may be allergenic in one allergen. The science isn't perfect. Dosing still depends on a range. The World Health Organization guidelines are 5 to 20 micrograms. There's excellent data to suggest BAU dosing is a, is a better answer because it's actually looking at uh, patient responses versus an analytic asset. Wait a second. 
say five to twenty, that's the goal you're aiming for for maximal yeah. doses. Maximal doses, anywhere between five to twenty. You'll notice that the 2011 practice parameters, some of those dosing ranges changed, Bermuda being one of them. Because even though Bermuda is listed as 10,000 BAUs, the problem with Bermuda was they didn't test Bermuda in a highly sensitive serum pool of sensitive patients to Bermuda grass. I believe Bermuda is probably 100,000 BAU grass. And if you look at the actual major protein in, in Bermuda, side D1, side N1, it actually is as hot as Timothy is when you look at the range of the major allergy. So it probably is 100,000. And if you notice the, uh, in the parameters from 2011, if you go back to 2007, or 2007, that dose changed. They actually lowered it because it is a hotter grass. Um, the immune system of each individual varies. Some individuals react to major allergens, some react to minor, some react to all the allergens. Maybe the major allergens turn the system on so the minor allergens react. Perhaps the minor allergens turn the system on so the major allergens react. We don't know. I mean, we're getting better at it, but we still don't have all the answers. Derpy 1 or Derpy 2? How many times have you heard that argument? That's my got 44 protein bands. Many of them are allergenic. Two have been proven to be highly allergenic. 50% of all patients failed to respond to either Derpy 1 or Derpy 2. Whether the relative potency of other well-characterized allergens are predictive of in vivo potency remains to be determined. Labeling allergen vaccines with the content of marker proteins not shown to predict the relative potency of the product is fraught with danger. Where a single allergen assay has not been shown to be predictive of the relative potency by bioassays such as Derpy-1, BAUs must be utilized. That was published in 1999. <clears throat> FDA standardization. Once an allergen standardization target is selected, the marketed products that contain the allergen will be examined and compared with the best products available worldwide. Biological potency will be established using the ID50 wheel method, and a surrogate test will be done and identified for lot release purposes. CBER intends to pursue these in this industry for all uh, extracts. The regulation requires that manufacturers comply with the standard and test each lot of the specified extract prior to release for sale. It took them 10 years to give you seven grasses. Cockroach has been before the FDA for 12 years. You do not have a standardized cockroach allergy. I do not believe that you will have another standardized allergy. Not my, I'm gonna be hitting golf balls on a golf course with Bermuda grass. Yeah, in Bermuda grass. <laughs> if he hits the green. <laughs> yeah. This happens to be a uh, allergen extract profile of d This happens to be immunoblot. The numbers <laughs> correlate to patient zero. And if you notice, patients put up to different proteins in that particular extract. Results indicated that P1 depletion of DP body extracts had no detectable effect on the activity in most patients. Namely, at least 70% of the activity was retained in the depleted extract. Skin test, blah, blah, blah. Now, this is interesting. The reason why this slide is in here, because some of these names you may uh, be familiar with are actually from Alcabella. And what I want to quote here is, however, major allergen content in and of itself does not completely determine potency of current allergen vaccines. Since other allergens, which may vary between extracts, also contribute to the biological potency, it is therefore still necessary to assess biological potency to avoid the misunderstanding that extract vaccines, even though they have equal major allergen content, are interchangeable. By ALK Alcabello's own PhD scientist. 
And again, it's just a rehash of that same quotation. This happens to be a deterrent of numerous lots. You can actually see the difference in the different lots. Can you explain that a little better, what we're seeing there? These are different lots. This is actually the molecular weight scale um, from different manufacturers. You can notice that some lots have much darker bands. It's probably harder, it's hard to see. But you can see how dark, dark those bands are. It means they're stronger. They have more allergen, more protein. So even manufacturers have differences in their, in their processes. If I was a manufacturer and being strictly ethical, I would take the one that has the best profile and the dark and, and the most allergens in it. If, if, if you believe the 5 to 20 microgram story, does that cover that range? Yeah. Yeah. Because you could, you know, being a purist, you could almost otherwise go back and say, well, this is a, a, a study of immunotherapy for grass that showed efficacy. Maybe I, I can only use that manufacturer. Yep. Yeah. And that's basically what you could almost be forced to because there is so much differences in the process. And if you look at that first, that slide I showed very early in the beginning, the phenolate, the phenol slide, that happened to have been Russian thistle. And we know that phenol denatures protein. It's in your practice parameters. It's real clear. So I guess my leaning is why would I use an extract that is manufactured in phenylated saline as the first extraction? Some manufacturers extract specifically in normal saline with phenol because it's faster to get it through the filter and sterilize it. Then they add glycerol, okay? And it'll say it on the label. It'll say 0.4% um, phenol and glycerol, which is an automatic clue that their first extraction was in phenol, phenolate, some type of phenol solution. On your SDS page slide, was that inner lots in one company or was that seven different companies? Different companies. Okay. And because I'm not biased or I, you know, disclaimers or whatever, I don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> this just shows you, uh, this is taken actually taken out of Middleton's text. Um, and these are the identified supposed uh, an antigens and different or allergens and different antigens. And they also give a frequency of reactivity. Patients skin tested the percent that were skin test positive. Yes. Ragweed MA1. MA1 is an only protein in short ragweed. Uh, there are at least six others. 15 to 20 percent of the patients do not react to MA1. This happens to be mountain cedar. Mountain cedar, so far that I've been able to glean and looking at the literature, it's probably the only pollinating plant that I've been able to identify that may have just a simple, single major allergen. However, there's been a couple of abstracts recently in the last couple of years out of Lackland Air Force Base that shows there may be two allergens in mountain cedar. Aspergillus or Aspergillus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, which one? I don't know. Maybe, maybe the old, you know, soup mix is a good idea. Alternaria, is it all 1, all 2, all 3, all 4? Which one? This is another interlot uh, looking at three different lots of uh, protein. And then this happens to be a mold. And interestingly enough, this is pretty close on this particular, on these particular three lots. This is red alder. And red alder seems to be pretty close except for one lot. That's lot number two. This is um, food extracts. This is pecan. Why is skin testing with food a crapshoot? You got lousy, really poor extracts for food testing. 
you're better off just using the real food, the real McClung. So don't buy any food extracts. I can't say that. <laughs> I wouldn't. This is Lamb's Quarters. You can see one of these lots is way out of whack with the other one. So as a manufacturer, you'd probably lose that, destroy that, or not, not um, use that lot. Major allergen. You eliminate the major allergen and still have allergenic activity. You, know, ultimate, you can alter the manufacturing process to remove different proteins. Patients respond to many different proteins. Total allergen allergenicity makes total sense. Where are the proteins? Again, this, I like this slide because as you can see, non-glycerin, we all know what's in non-glycerinated extract, right? Anybody? Non-glycerinated extract? Phenol. Yep. Phenol. Yeah. And that's in there because it's bactericidal. Glycerin's bacteriostatic. You can't grow anything. If you notice the glycerinated extracts, these happen to be three different manufacturers. The glycerinated extracts are pretty comparable. I would probably choose this one or that one versus the middle one because these bands look much darker than the middle one. And then if you went over to the SDS page, I would definitely choose one of the two that I chose earlier because look what happened to the middle one as far as the immunoblots. Phenol is added, this is right out of your text. This happens to be out of Locky. It's in the second edition, third edition, fourth edition. It's in the practice parameters. I don't know why anybody would use it would use phenol. Then this again just talks about the potency between glycerinated and phenylated uh, extracts. These are some early studies that were done. This is short ragweed. Look what happens to the shelf life of short ragweed over time depending on room temperature and storage temperature in phenol. This shows uh, Russian thistle, which happens to have one, two, three, four, five, six binding proteins. It's a patient serum. PAU is, is the concept of the government. We're over time. Do you want me to go? Okay. Uh, all the allergenic, it looks at all of the allergenic extract parts. It can be used to measure specific dose ranges. It eliminates having to find, measure, or define major allergen. If an adequate BAU dose is given, you're probably given sufficient major allergen. How do I know that? Because if you look at the ranges of major allergen, even in the standardized grasses, they vary. They vary. Anywhere from, depends on what analy uh, analytical, analytical assay you use, anywhere from, let's say, 81 to 300 or something. <clears throat> depends on which protein you're looking at. 5 to 15% of the patient population was not reactive with Feldy 1. It's been reported that you need 0.279 to 4.79 Feldy 1 units to achieve maximum therapeutic levels. Is Feldy 1 unit the same as micrograms? No. You have to multiply Feldy 1 unit by 1 to 4, depending on whose assay, to get micrograms. Cat albumin has allergenic proteins. And there seems to be cross-reactivity between albumin and all mammals. Dogs, cats, cows, horses. Are we confused? What do I use for those? BAUs, major allergen, weight to volume, PNUs. At one time, the FDA wanted all those numbers on a patient file label. But thanks to your, I guess you'd call it a lobby, um, your specialty lobby said, if you think we're confused now, Imagine what's going to happen if you put five numbers on that label. Instead of weight to volume, you'd have BAUs, major allergen, weight to volume, P and U's. So what do you mix to or what do you mix by? 
Which is safer, VA use or major allergen? What's the literature say? Currently, the literature is leaning towards proving that major allergen may not be the only antigen that's important. Derpy 1, Derpy 2 shows this, AMI 1 illustrates it, ALT 1, ALT 2 indicates this, Feldy 1 defines it. We looked at bio uh, image in the SDS page, proteins may not be allergenic, consistently provide all the allergens in the extract, SDS page and not all proteins are allergenic, major bio image are methods to show all proteins, immunoblots show allergenic protein. One of the things that I was looking at, at for standardization, this is just some more immunoblots, is I wanted to tag each one of the proteins at the beginning of the process with an isotope so that when I fin finished the filtration process and I finished all the things I did to that extract, if I didn't have the same isotopes at the end of it, something happened. Except that that's a very laborious, time, expensive, consuming process, so it's not going to happen. In the future, it may be necessary to determine not only the allergen composition, but also the isoallergen spectrum of in-house references and immediate products, intermediate products using techniques such as 2G gel electrophoresis, capillary electrophoresis, or mass spectrometry, which would become routine techniques for allergen standardization. I think 3D mapping is going to be part of that process. I think we're actually going to start looking at the individual epitopes, peptides, and so forth of the actual molecular structure with 3D mapping. That way, I, if I start the process and I have a map or a picture and I finish the process, I better have the same picture or at least the same map. Any questions? You said at the outset of this section that Venom is the one standardized. How is that? Why are they able to make that so? Because Venom is actually micrograms of Venom. It takes X amount of Venom to give you 100 micrograms. And that never changes. It's How always do you know the, the composition of, you know, if the insect may make different proteins in its Venom time to time, year to year, so could you be fooling yourself to say this is exactly There's two assays that are used to make sure that there you have adequate um, hydrolonophase and uh, phospholipase, which are the two major proteins that cause So you have a further standing of standardizing it beyond weight. Yeah, so it yeah. Has you're, you're, it's beyond weight. Yeah. You're looking, at, you're looking at the individual components of that particular extract. That hasn't been done with these others just because it's so difficult to determine what yeah. the Plus, there's no assays. Very few assays exist to look at major allergen. Um, and when you have an assay that is plus or minus 17 to 25 percent to begin with, I have a background in analytical chemistry. I will laugh at you. Okay? For me, standardization is plus or minus 0.00001. And you're looking at something that the government let go of that's 100 to 300? That's a heck of a window. One of the reasons why, if you look at since the standardized grasses came out, one of the reasons why you've had less deaths from allergen immunotherapy, your standardized grasses are weaker, much weaker. I had Timothy lots and perennial rye lots that ran 5 million BAUs. No. And you're getting 100,000? So we took that window from this, okay, and brought it down to here. But the difficulty is, I don't think you'll see another standardized actor because of all the difficult processes. I know your, your data on the pollens and the extracts is one thing, but what about when we use RAS tests to confirm stuff? Is that equally bad or worse than the current stuff you just presented? Two schools of thought. If I drew your blood and sent it to five labs, I'll probably get five different answers. That's What's the question? question? There's no standardization. There's no standardization of the reagents. There's no standardization of the process. There's no standardization of what they use as a reference. So each lab can do whatever they want. Okay. There's no government regulations other than CLIA to ensure that whoever's running the test has validated it or validates routinely. I've got a degree in cardiopulmonary technology. Part of our responsibility was to go around and every 24 to 48 hours, we had 15 different blood gas machines 
in the, in the cardiovascular hospital. We had to go validate them every 24 to 48 hours because they drift, okay? You don't have that in the mass labs. I haven't seen it. I mean, they may have a protocol, but I haven't seen it actually in, in, in process. So there's differences. RAS is pretty good if you're looking at the mid-range patients. If you look at the low responders and the real, I call them the hot shots, the real atopic hot people, you could be off on both those on both those ranges simply because of the process. So it's it's exceedingly likely that if they're negative on a skin test and negative on a RAS test, we just struck out both times and we didn't get the answer? I will answer that depending on what extract you're using for skin testing. Because there's a difference in manufactured extract. As a purist, I would say that you want a 50% glycerinated extract for skin testing. You want the strongest dilution you can get for skin testing, which is one of the things that I was absolutely adamant about when I lost that, that war, was I don't believe there should be a 10,000 BAU grass skin test. There's no need for it. Why use something that might miss patients <clears throat> versus 100,000? And if you look at your own literature and your own textbooks, the recommendation is what do you use for skin testing? The strongest available solution, right? Can I answer you? Yeah, but it didn't make me feel any better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Any other questions in the room? We got it all straightened out now. Yeah, it's all straight. <laughs> uh, actually, I, as I was listening to you, it would be intriguing for us to do a poll amongst ourselves what we skin test to, see if we could come up with more uniformity. I mean, certainly I know in our office, we're not usually working with Johnson grass or Bermuda grass. I've just more or less accepted if you've lived your whole life here, you're not sensitive to those, we don't have to consider them. Should we change what we're doing? We should have a community discussion of this. We'll see if we can do that on a journal session. Maybe have a fellow collect some data. <laughs> if, uh, if you go to this to the skin test practice parameter, um, there the rewrite there. The last one was published in 1995. In there, there's a very good list of phylogenetic groups and what falls under them. And if you look at the grasses, there's roughly, I think there's about 400 and something grasses on that list. So if you look at that list and that, it'll give you an idea of how many grasses do exist. And I don't know what particular strains exist in Washington. But I'm from Texas and I can tell you we have all kinds of stuff. Uh, from grandma grass to uh, Bermuda to <coughs> Timothy to rye, all of them. We, we cover all the families, I think, down there, because we have actually four, flor four true floristic zones. And, uh, but if you look at that, that'll give you an idea of you might not have Johnson grass here, but you may very well have something in that family or in that genus that exists in, in the area. The usual wisdom here with grass is Timothy Velvet Orchard, which are all cross-reactive as northern grasses and not much else unless anybody else has different information. Well, thank you. We'll thank you. Right if you come up with any questions or anything, give Sean a call and he can get in touch with you. I feel great. I feel great. I I Thank you.